Sir, can I please have your name and job title? My name is Jeremy Coney, and I don't have any job title or fixed abode. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do you think are the two greatest eras in New Zealand cricket history? Well, I imagine we're going to be talking about those, but, <laughs> um, but I, I would mention very briefly uh, 19, there are a few, a few through, uh, through New Zealand history. I would mention 1949, uh, when they headed, uh, you know, Richard Hadley's dad, Walter Hadley was the captain, came to England. They played three-day tests, and they wanted to achieve a, a higher number of games and, a, and longer games. That was their whole point and raison d'etre to coming over to England in 49. I would mention very briefly 6061 uh, when John Reed was the captain against South Africa and they played against a lively South African side. Um, lots of good players in that South African side, lots of fast bowlers, Heine, Adcock, Pocock, you know, there were, there were lots. And they managed to draw that series and win our first test match away from home. Um, and then I would mention Stephen Fleming's side. I think probably in this around the 2000s, um, they had a very strong side as well. So those sides and perhaps the 80s side that I was part of and also obviously Kane Williamson's side. Would you say that now the, the consensus is probably that the Kane Williamson side that won the World Test Championship is the best um, team in New Zealand history? Well, consensus. Um, I guess the modern consensus would be that way because they're just so much closer uh, to, to remembering it. Um, and I, um, I, I'm reluctant to necessarily say they are way better than some of those other sides. See, I, I, culturally, I find the, com the comparison of different eras, I find it quite tricky. Um, Mainly, you know, because, I mean, at the moment, the, the removal of failure, for example, is quite, as a batsman, is quite, you know, a common thing. That's what they talk about a great deal. And what that has an implication for is the scoring rate, in particular, per over, and therefore using time to attack with the ball a lot more because you've already got your runs. You're getting on with the game very quickly. So that was never the case, for example, when, when we played. Fear was quite high in the gullet, and so you, had, you, you wanted to remain at the crease as long as possible. Um, I think the, the, the sophistication of bat-making has changed a great deal, I think. Uh, I think that combined with the wider range of shots that players use nowadays so they can access wide different sectors of the ground that we couldn't. I think that pitches are less variable nowadays as they used than they used to be. I think I have a feeling it was a little harder to bat, but it's only a sense. Um, I think the you know the sophistication that goes with pitch preparation nowadays is better and more reliable. The size of the grounds was much larger uh, in those days. I remember us pacing out, for example, on the MCG, how wide the boundary was, and it got to 105 yards. Now, you would not... That's two boundaries, almost, nowadays. So there were kind of... There were lots of differences when we, when we do talk about these teams that you kind of got to remember. You know, the overs that but the players... Bold, you know, the number of balls that you had bowled at you. Apart from the West Indies, which was a little bit different when we played them, but most other sides would get through. Nowadays, we know that we're going to get an extra half hour at the end of every day. It's just tacked on, isn't it? And it's becoming quite an issue between administrators and players at the moment. So, you know, I think the other thing is I want to make the point Results basically nowadays seem to me binary. You either win or you lose. Now, ours were tertiary. <laughs> we had a thing called draw in the middle. And, for example, this, our side looked at um, not losing as a way to improvement. So, in other words, every test we went into, 
that was our first a goal in a way, so that, that, that we would get to that point perhaps in the midway in the game. And if we felt secure enough, we would then go on and try and win it. That's not the way that it's played nowadays. So those, with those kind of, I don't know, just thoughts that I have when we talk these two sides, but I'd, I'd always like to feel that those were, you know, going to be at the background because they certainly informed the way that we played and the way that they're playing now, which is much different. Yeah, I, I think... So the era, the, the two eras that I think they stand up the most, and if you have a look at the, the graph that we've got up on the screen, you see that obviously the modern team looks very good in terms of wins and losses. And then the other team that was very dominant is that 1981 to the end of 1986 sort of period. Um, and they are very different. And so what I really wanted to do is sort of make it a little bit more simple. For instance, they had more teams to play and, and some of those teams are far weaker than everyone else. And I, my original thought was, so I, I know that you had a very, let me say a rowdy conversation, uh, Jeremy, with Tim Wigmore in, in a bar where he put to you that the modern team was better than your team. And you, you fought your corner very, very well, um, as, as you tend to do. Uh, and at the time, I think I agreed with Tim. In fact, I think Tim might have got some of the research from me at that, at that point. <clears throat> but the more I have looked at this, even when you have to factor in the differences of those different eras, is that... It, while it doesn't look as good because you didn't win as many test matches and didn't play as many test matches um, in your era, there's actually a really good case to say that you were as strong back in the early 80s as you were as, as the team was under Kane Williamson. But there's a lot of different things that we need to look at, isn't there? Because, for instance, these days, New Zealand are very much compared to how they do against Australia. You guys played very well against Australia, but the Australian team that you went up against was nowhere near as strong as the, the kinds of Australian teams that, that Williamson had to go up against. So you kind of have to rethink everything when you're, when you're having this discussion, don't you? Yeah, I think that's, that's very fair. That's, <clears throat> that, that's just teams change. Um, hmm. And they tend to be generational things, don't they? That you, if you have a happy coincidence of a number of players coming together, that last graph that you were showing me about you know, the two sides and their win-loss ratio. I mean, you could see, for example, that there was a, a strength in New Zealand around the 80s. And then it took until we get to Stephen Fleming, which is about 2000, his side was in there as well, in the middle. Um, so that, so those middle peaks would be Stephen Fleming's team. And then, of course, the highest peaks of the lot, of course, are Kane Williamson's later on so but you can also see that as far as my point about generational sides mm. it takes about you know almost a decade to go from one decent new zealand side through to the next through to the next and that has actually been quite a pattern in new zealand cricket um throughout we we haven't been able to sort of just take out the peaks and the troughs and just sort of even it out a little bit, you know, because it is that happy coincidence, because we don't tend the garden quite as well as we might to have enough players coming through all the time and to, to have a sort of a levelling out process. I think if you looked at other sides, you might find the stronger teams, you might find a much more level kind of graph rather than the up and down that we're seeing from New Zealand. No, I think, I think that's very, very true. And the other thing that you mentioned before um, is that just the draws. So oh, you draws, have yeah. so many draws in your period. Um, and you can see them home and away draws and everywhere else. We know that teams don't actually draw away from home anymore. Uh, you know, all, basically all the, the, all the games that used to be drawn by teams away from home have gone towards wins for the home team. And if you go to the modern New Zealand side, you see that there really aren't a lot of draws no. and they only have one draw away from home. Yeah. Um, and the other big difference, of and that's course, usually is that rain, you're, you're, isn't it, Jared? That's usually rain <laughs> these days. Yeah. Um, and if you look at, uh, if you look at the other um, thing here is that you have a lot of wins at home and away. 
and the modern team again you actually have even though you play fewer tests you have more wins away from home and you can see that really what has happened with that modern team is they are completely dominant at home which is a great thing to be jeremy i think we both agree but they're not as strong as you were away from home i think that's very fair isn't it yeah i <clears throat> i'm i think that what we found it took us a time to get going though jared um mm -hmm. I mean, we we found what we did was we would win one test in, say, a three-test series. And we might lose that series, depending on who you're playing. But it was the win. And we slowly got a process of how do you win overseas? Were we able to be consistent enough? Because you've got to remember also, we had perhaps, you know, we had John Wright, of course, who played for Derbyshire. We had Jeff Howarth, who played for Surrey, who were professionals. Glenn Turner was around a little bit at the start of the 8081 sort of era as well. Who was, you know, he was obviously at Worcestershire. Um, but really, the rest of us were, were very much secondary kind of teachers, and we had a freezing worker, um, we had a grave digger, we had sports distributors, we had, you know, it was very much. Um, a Saturday afternoon flavour still, trying to be better than that and slowly getting better at it um, and trying to learn from the things. I, I, my memories are of as a team sitting down at the end of the day's play, sitting around having a beer and discussing how on earth are we going to play this chap Mushtaq tomorrow, bowling round the wicket into the rough, what sort of shots can we play? And we would sit down for probably an hour and have various ideas coming from maybe five or six of us having this discussion and talking about what we would do about this. And that's how we had to learn. And, and so we learned, we, had, we only had each other, no coaches in those days. I mean, we all had little jobs to do. I'm sure, you know, I was in charge of practice balls. You know, that seems a little weird to say that, whereas there are people who look after these things, I imagine, nowadays. John Brasswell used to look after the flag. He would take the flag up to the person who put it back up on the flagpole over the game that we were playing, and then he'd go and get it at the end of the day and to bring it back and then off to the next venue. I mean, we had those kinds of little... Some was in charge of what's the clothes we're wearing today, fellas? What sort of... Are we number ones or are we... You know, now this may not be important in terms of the discussion that we're having. All it is is, again, that cultural kind mm. of difference of where we were at the time and how we ran things and how we had to run things because we didn't have a coach. Uh, you know, it was us who ran the, uh, ran the practices. And so we learned from our, each other. We learned from, you know, listening to the pros. And we tended to turn our eyes towards England a bit more than Australia, um, which we then changed at a certain point. Um, and that's how we slowly got better and better. I mean, to be fair, uh, we were forged very quickly it was a team that was cultivated over about seven or eight years from the late sort of mid 70s through to the start of the 80s and that's where all the players came from and uh, we we then met the West Indies just prior to this period you're discussing and that was our first mm -hmm. series together and so that was at, at, in New Zealand and that was just really an extraordinary you know experience and we survived it which was which was even more extraordinary actually um, it was a, an acrimonious three tests we managed to sneak over the lines with the two of the worst run leg buys in the world um, to win that first test um, and then we managed to hold the West Indies off and they just got more and more angry with, with decision-making and so on by umpires, um, that they just got bowled shorter and shorter. First time we'd ever worn helmets. I don't know, I lost count of the number of times as we threw our heads back to get out of the line of the ball that our helmets fell off. And we very quickly learned to have a chin strap underneath um, to hold it on. But again, these are just things that people won't think about when they're listening 
mm. to, to the two sides and the differences between these two sides. But yes, as far as that, you know, that graph about draws you're showing is, is you know, significant. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the whole amateur thing is interesting also because England, obviously, at least semi-professional or towards a professional lineup, and the West Indies were becoming professional by being overseas players and through Kerry Packer. And New Zealand cricket, by comparison, was very amateur at that period. So you are going up against not only a great West Indian team, but a West Indian team that, you know, are travelling like professionals and starting to think and, and play like professionals. And as you said, you just had the three uh, county players. Well, two, really, because Glenn Turner wasn't always around. If you look at the batting, you have a very solid core of about five guys who are averaging over uh, 35. The only player uh, that really makes a lot of runs um, when he plays is uh, Reed. And I'll get to him in a moment, but you could see that all the way through, you know, John Wright, yourself, Martin Crow. Martin Crowe's average might surprise some people here, but it's really the late 80s yeah. where Martin Crowe really yep. explodes. Bruce Edgar. But then you've got the Howarth, the Hadley, the other Crow, Ian Smith. Everyone was chipping in. So it wasn't a great batting lineup. But when I look at this, and when I look at his overall record, you know, uh, the, 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 what was it? J.F. Reed, isn't it? Uh, not, not, not John R. Reed, the original uh, uh, Reed. He was obviously a fantastic player and has a really good record in this period. Why did he not play as much test cricket as, as some of the rest of you? Um, I think because he preferred to play slow bowling and he was really invited to come in and bat number three or four. He batted four for a start and then went up to three. Um, and he was a very fine player of spin bowling. And he just didn't feel quite so comfortable against the quicker stuff. I was lucky, you know, really, because I was the opposite. Um, and, and you look at Wright and Edgar there, particularly our two openers, mm. two, two very fine left-handed openers, line players, that's what they looked for, and so they missed out on drives sometimes because the ball was full, but they were looking to let go. And I don't know how many times even Australian bowlers, Tom O and Lily and co., were so frustrated bowling to those two because they just let them go all the time. Very good judges of line, mm. very hard workers, both, you know, solid, stolid, dependable citizens, both of them. And so... Um, working hard and and really blunting any kind of attack and a lot there were a lot of fast bowlers around at that time Jared I I don't mm -hmm. you know when I think and I just quickly I mean Pasco Hogg Lily Thompson Lawson McDermott not many spinners coming out of Australia in those in the 80s really I mean Higgs was there and uh, Holland was there um, you know, Mallet had finished um, you're about mm. to perhaps move into Tim May, but that was after. That was after we played, and then you came to England. You had you Willis. Faced, you faced a lot of Greg Matthews. Greg Matthews well. wasn't really a spinner, though, was he? I mean, he was a no. he was a part spinner. He bowled a lot against us in the uh, sort of '85 mm. series, and did okay. But I mean, he he, he wasn't what I would call a get it up in the air and drop it in front of you, that kind of spinner. He was a, a batsman first who bowled a few. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I don't yeah. mean to, I'm not trying to downgrade him at all, but, you know, he's not like Murley. He's not like those kinds of bowlers no. who are about to come, you know, later. Um, and, and in, but what you're saying is that that era was, that's an era when spin bowling was really, really struggling all around the world, right? So if you weren't playing seam bowling well or you didn't like playing seam bowling, it was probably a tougher era to be a, a player. Is, is that the way yeah, you're putting I think, it? I think for particular, I think J.F. Reed got hundreds against Pakistan in Pakistan. Uh, and he also got two or three hundreds, I think, in the versus uh, Pakistan when they came down to New Zealand in 85 straight after that tour. And he also did pretty well against India. So they, that, that's where I think you'd find the bulk of J.F. Reed's runs were. You've just gone off there but from my screen. I can still hear you. It's fine. Yeah. Can, um, can you hear me, Jeremy? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Um, well, what, what I was going to say is that 
I think the big difference in your era to kind of any other New Zealand era ever is that the combination of Wright and Edgar, as you talked about before, because New Zealand cricket really had never found two openers at the same time. You know, obviously there had been some good openers that had come through from on occasion, but the idea of finding two openers in an era when seam bowling was so important certainly um, uh, was very important because if you look at the rest of this lineup, it's kind of a similar kind of thing we see with New Zealand where lots of people can bat, they can all chip in. That's the regular part of New Zealand batting. But the, the thing that stands out is probably the openers, especially in an era where the opening bowls around the world were so good. Yep, I think that's a fair point. And they certainly provided a really strong basis for us. We would normally, for example, like to bowl in New Zealand. We felt that that's when the pitch was at its greenest. Um, and therefore, what are the best conditions for Richard Hadley to, to thrive? Um, and then you got to day two and three, you know, even if you hadn't bowled the opposition out, the, the conditions were still such that you could bat and get runs. And so that comes back to that, you know, we're not going to be under pressure by the end of day three quite to the extent if we bat first and get bowled out. And so that was the way we tended to approach things at Hope. And, it, and it's the way they do now as well, the, the, where the pitch is virulent green, they'll look to bowl first against sides. If they're put in, they're put in. They just live with that, and they're getting better at that. But, yeah, uh, yeah I think the other thing I would mention about that, that graph about our batsmen, you get, you know, you look at, say, I was batting, say, six, and then you had Hadley at mm. seven. Now, look where he is on the graph. And then you got sort of mm. Smith. You see where he is on the graph. And then you got Cairns a little bit, and Cairns, had 60s and 50 not outs and so on. Some of obviously some failures as well. But you know, and Bracewell then getting test centuries later on in this period we're talking about. So though that lower order, if I could bat with that lower order, sometimes we would double the total from five down, and that really kept us in the game on a number of occasions. And, and we had everybody hmm. who could bat. Now, the current New Zealand side, for example, can't do that. When they get to seven with a Santner, Santner, and then you go down to eight, nine, ten, eleven, they're all bowlers, but they can't bat. And so the question then hmm. becomes, in my mind, are you bowling well enough? Can you really get people out quickly enough to counteract the fact that you can't bat much? So I think those are issues that we didn't have to confront with, with this group of players. Hmm. Well, I mean, if you look, this is the modern team. So obviously, yeah. Kane Williamson's yep. massively high. Then, then you've got, you can see where their top four or five batters are. Then you've got DeGrand Homer's an all-rounder. You've got, you know, poor Jeet Raval, who never quite made it. Tom Blundell, uh, towards the end, did very well. But you're right, look at the, the tail is just yeah. very, very low, you know, of, of Wagner um, and Saudi and Bolt. And to be honest, I think they've all done pretty well, considering their bat batting talent. Um, but yeah, it's a very different looking graph. Now, the other thing I would say here is you can see that, you know, Williamson has a very high average and most of these players have a slightly higher average than the players yeah. in your era. But this is very, and, and this is something that a lot of older cricketers um, have made the point at, uh, a lot when talking about this New Zealand team is a lot of those runs have been made against West Indies, Bangladesh and uh, Zimbabwe, right? And when I looked at it, if you took those three teams out, you actually both played in an era where, you know, there were six other sides that you were playing against who were all of decent quality, right? And it was quite clear that the West Indies, Bangladesh and Zimbabwe in that period were not quite as strong. And so I took that out just to show that when you do that, obviously Williamson is still very, very good. And uh, old friend J.F. Reed uh, with his uh, spin play has a very good record. But the rest of the batters are more or less from either era pretty much as good as each other. There isn't really as many standout batters now. Um, you know, you, you can see here that you've got, you know, Bruce Edgar and, and Ross Taylor, you know, all in that sort of area together. Mark, uh, then you've got, you know, Martin Crow is not that far from where Henry Nichols is and all these sorts of different um, situations. John Wright and Tom Latham suddenly look very similar when you're looking at them against the best attacks. And I did that, Jeremy, because you only, you know, the weakest team that you played against. They had just Shrinker. started, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, but if you look at their record uh, and you look at the way that they played, they didn't win a lot of test matches, but they were still reasonably strong. 
Whereas if you compare that to Bangladesh, West Indies and Zimbabwe, there was an obvious drop off of talent between those teams and these teams. So it's not completely fair. As we said, it's different eras. We'll never, it'll never be 100% fair. But I th do you think this shows that your, the batting in your era was actually slightly stronger than it would look? It's just that the averages are lower because it was a very tough era to play in. And you had, you had no, there was no respite. There were no easy attacks for you to go up against. Uh, whereas for this New Zealand side, they did have some of those easy attacks where they, their, their players could cash in. So when I showed you this, were you surprised? Or is this more of how you had thought um, about it in your head? A little surprised to see it grouped the way the way that that, that does come out there. Once that's with the teams removed, right? The easier teams removed of the current the, yep. of the more modern yeah, so side. So it does show, in yep. fact, that we we kind of held our own at that time. Um, more spinners nowadays, or not? Would you say than than when we played? As I say, really only Pakistan. You know, with Abdul Qadir, and then they, they you know, they had um, Iqbal Kazim, the, the, the left armour, who was very, very clever bowler, actually. Uh, and then Tausif Ahmed, which is the off spinner there. And so when, when you played against Pakistan, they, they were a strong side um, in our era. Mm. Perhaps, the, and, the, and of course, we had the generational side of the West Indies that was clearly better than anybody else. Um, so and then it was really Pakistan who could damage you on any day. Um, the rest of the, the rest of the teams we always felt, yeah, we're in with a chance. And if we were playing at home, of course, even more so. But but when we were away, hmm. um, that they you know it was Pakistan and the West Indies. We felt even in England we had a chance. Hmm. Well, I think of your era. It was the seam bowlers that were dominant, and then you had Pakistan. And in their era, obviously, you know, this, this New Zealand side has had to go over and face Jadeja and Ashwin yeah. on pitches that are, that are suited towards them. So, it, yeah, I, I do think things have changed quite dramatically in the way that, they, uh, that the two teams have played. But, but I think what this shows is that we, if you look at it on raw numbers, you would say that the modern New Zealand batting lineup is a lot better. But when you actually do start to dig down, it's probably not as separated as what a casual fan or someone who isn't watching as closely uh, would understand. And this, as you've just said, you, n you never had to go and play, you know, you had to play the West Indies, but you never no, had to play No, we didn't Ashton play against Asia India at all. At that, not at that time guys. over in India. I didn't ever tour India. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Exactly. So it is very different. So with the bowlers, I'm just going to bring up, um, I say optimistically, uh, or is that the same one? Oh, that is the same one. Uh, with the bowlers, uh, I, I've, I made a similar uh, graph, which is a little bit more hilarious just because, of course, Richard Hadley is so, so different to everyone else. But again, I don't, and I don't think any player from your era would, would disagree here. That obviously, Richard Hadley was by far and away better than any of the modern bowlers that we have seen in New Zealand. But that, that next generation of uh, bowlers, of Bolt, Wagner, Southie, and now Jameson, who's come through, are certainly a lot better than the bowlers that you had, you know, you and Chatfield and um, uh, Lance Cairns, Chris Cairns' father. Uh, from a seam bowling perspective, you have the best bowler, and by a distance in Richard Hadley, but they have the next four best seamers. Yeah, I think, I think that's that, probably fair. We were always um, trying to work out. We got a couple of reliable ones in, in Lance Cairns and you and Chatfield. And mm. um, they had to bowl a lot of overs. One a swing bowler, one a seam bowler, and both very fit. Ken strong, a freezing worker, and and they could bowl heavy overs. Um, and they learned as they went along, particularly Ken's, to have variety and the importance of variety. And so, you know, that's why you see him occasionally shining and getting seven for against England and things like that when things were just going well for him. And um, so, so there was that part, but that was always a, the number three was always a slightly difficult spot for us that we didn't really nail. But what we did have, I don't know whether you've got it there, it shows it, are the spinners. We, we had, as we went through this period, Bracewell was there and Bock was there at the start, a left arm orthodox and a right mm. arm off spinner, and they got better and better. And then we, they were joined by a guy called Evan Gray towards the end of this period in 83 to 86. 
So we actually changed the nature of our side in a sense, and it came down to instead of just, you know, three or four and one, three and an all-rounder and, and one spinner, it became three and two because Gray could bat and, and Bracewell could bat as well. And so we actually changed that sort of slightly... So we were always threatening an outside edge with a spinner. We could always use um, different parts of the pitch to attack bowlers. We could always, you know, when there was some, you know, follow-through marks on the surface, we could bring them back into the play. So, and that was a hell of a lot, you know, a different way than New Zealand had played historically. We had been mm. very much a seam-dependent de attack and virtually just sort of a make-up spinner. And um, we'd had a little, we'd had one or two throughout our history, but that was that that was generally, you know, the blueprint for our sides. But this started to really change mm. when Bracewell started to beat teams and take six and seven wickets, as he did in Auckland, you know, against the Australians, as he did in India when they went there and they won a match there as well. Mm. So. This was quite a major change for us. So I would say, yes, you know, they're, they're generally their seamers, their modern side seamers overall, not as good as Hadley, but very, very effective. Swing bowlers, and then one who found a different way to get people out um, in, in Wagner, and very effective at it, very effective. Um, his lack of height actually helped him. I felt skiddy kind of bowler at you, and so. Um, mm. But I would then counter it. The only thing I would say is that I think our spinners kind of counteracted that a little. I, I think you're right. I, I know this is your most fervent point when you've got the glass of red in front of you <laughs> and you're talking about this team. Is you, you'll suddenly say, "But what? Where are their spinners?" Um, and if you look at this and you see that Santana did not take many wickets and took him at a very, very poor average. And, and Ajaz Patel, we obviously know, took 10 wickets in one innings, but still did not take a lot of wickets for them um, overall. You know, the period that we're looking at is from, uh, you know, 2016 to the end of 2021. So it's a six-year period, the same that we were looking at um, uh, for you guys. And yet they don't have a spinner who takes over 30 wickets in that period. That's, it's, it's I, I mean, it's not going to surprise anyone that they have struggled with spin, but it really is stark when you do look at this. And really, yeah. Colin de Grandhomme basically plays as their spinner, right? I, yeah, and, and, you know, he was a very economical bowler and a very a very yeah. good player. I think very underrated player for the, the job that he actually did. But they didn't have a spinner. And that had to have held them back in certain situations in a way that you always had access to someone who was at least of an international quality of a spin bowler. Neither of your spin bowlers went on to have great records. We're, we're not saying that Bracewell and Bock were, you know, champions of the craft. But you knew that when you needed to throw the ball to them, you felt very comfortable. Whereas the modern team really never had that, did they? Oh, can you hear me? Hello? I, I couldn't hear you. I lost you. You, you dropped in? out there. I'm sorry. Okay. What I said at the end was that the modern team just have never had a spinner they could just throw the ball to even in no, favourable conditions. That, that certainly was is, is my impression. Um, and Bock was a... I mean, when we needed someone, you know, to put pressure and keep pressure on, and, you know, so he was an economy rate man and very accurate. But if you wanted to attack him, go ahead and do your best. Uh, but then Bracewell was a very different kind of bowler, so that's what I liked about the two of them as well. He would get the ball to drop and to dip and to turn, went for more runs, perhaps at times, but he would pick up wickets. He'd suddenly, if he hit, if everything went well, suddenly he'd have three or four wickets, and that would change a game for you. Hmm. No, I think, I think that's very fair. The only thing I would say is that I mean, obviously, Hadley is yeah. so much better than the other seamers, but having four seamers available to them yeah. and, and very varied seamers as well, you know, a, a left-arm seamer, a right-arm swing bowler, someone who's six foot 12, 
Um, and obviously Neil Wagner, who you described before, they had a very variable attack, except for the fact that they just didn't have that spinner. But when you do look at that modern side, I think the two, two, the two players that I think would have been really handy for your era would have been Colin de Grandom and BJ Watling, right? They would have come in, a very, you know, I think BJ Watling was probably more of a factor in the games that he played in than Ian Smith was, although I'm sure Ian Smith was probably more fun <laughs> to tour with than BJ Watling. But those are the two players. <laughs> I'm, I'm just assuming this, uh, Jeremy. But those are the two players that I think would have been really handy from that modern era that would have played for you. And obviously in, their, in, in, the, in the modern era, they would have loved to have had the ability to have Bracewell yeah. or, or Bob. I, I think um, Smith, um, Smith was a terrific hand-eye coordinated person. So his keeping... And, and as you say, being seam-based, most of our keepers stand back and don't get a lot of practice standing up to spinners when the ball is ragging a little bit. And so that's quite difficult for them, and they have to learn it as they go on the spot. Um, Smith was very good at that. And, um, and we would have liked Watling's runs. There's no doubt about that. Every, I think every side would have liked the keeper to score the number of runs that he was able to. That allowed them to play kind of an extra bowler, didn't it? Because he batted six at the end. So, you know, that's yeah. a strength of that side that perhaps we didn't have. Um, and de Grandom, yeah, num useful number seven. Our number seven, of course, was Hadley. So, and he would get runs as well. So, uh, you know, it's it swings and roundabouts a bit, isn't it? Um, I, mm. Maybe in New Zealand conditions, their attack would be more dangerous. Yeah, e exactly. I, I think that that's fair. And also, just because of the variability that they had with the left armor and yeah. the left armors and and the extra height and everything, you know, th there was there's something quite interesting about them. But there's no doubt that you know they could have used the two spinners and you know um, Watling. I, I think Watling really changes it. I mean. We're, if you had someone who could average 35 or 40 batting at number six with the gloves, that would have made yeah. your team even more dynamic. Would I have think. kicked me uh, out. Would have given you so many more yeah, options. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's what you're. Yeah, I mean, that's what you're aiming. Although, <laughs> what I'm really yeah, looking exactly. for is a team that doesn't need Jeremy Coney in it. Uh, uh, so what I did was I looked at the net average per wicket, Jeremy, which is something that's a little bit more fair than win-loss ratios, only because, as we know, there was a lot of draws in your era and there aren't a lot of draws in the modern era. Um, and, and we're looking for consistency over a period of time, not just, you know, winning a test match with a couple of leg buys at the end or, yeah. um, you know, those sorts of things. We're looking at wow, uh, you know, consistency uh, over a long period of time. Quite clearly... You're positive, but look, I mean, yeah. West Indies is ridiculous <laughs> in their six. This yeah. isn't even their best six year period, I don't think either. Uh, but they were absolutely ridiculous. They were you know, more than 10 runs a ball in the positive. Uh, sorry, more than 10 runs a wicket in the positive um, all the way through when they played. When you take, you know, when you take their batting average and you take away their bowling average, they were f fantastic. A lot of people don't know how good that Pakistan team was. They actually, I think, briefly got to number one ranking during the West Indies um, reign. Um, absolutely dominant team and you didn't even i think this period is probably before whack aaron Yunus, uh whack aaron Yunus, whack aaron was in come together um and, but it was a very very strong team that early 1980s team and then the third best team in your era is uh is you jeremy now when i showed you this you uh, originally were a little bit like wow that's that's quite good it does show you how strong that team was but also there was no way you were ever going to really compete with Pakistan and West Indies. They were just so much more talented than your 11s. Yeah, That's I fair to say. Yeah, uh, I, I think, I mean, we would, we would beat Pakistan and New Zealand, you know, at home most times, most times. Yeah. Um, we, West Indies, we beat uh, in 79, 80, and then they came back um, Yep. in 87 just after this period and we drew that series but we also in 85 went over to yep. the west indies we played a four test series against them we drew the first two port of spain and down in guyana georgetown and then they put us on on you know on barbados and then um you know then kingston so it was it was we lost that series too and deservedly i mean they were a better side so um, mm. But that's that's an that's an interesting one because so you were I wondered the best because teams. of the, the the strength of the West Indies there in the graph, how we managed to say positive when mm. we played them 
you know, a reasonable amount of times over this, you know, three times over this period, that, 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 wasn't, that, that effect wouldn't have kicked in. Perhaps draws kicks in a wee bit as well because we're getting enough runs. And even when we were in Pakistan, yeah. um, I had a look at the Pakistan tour and, you know, the score is, scores in the first innings. You know, we, we batted at Lahore and play, batted really badly and got 157, but we bowled them out for 220. So we were still kind of in the game. Um, you know what I mean? In the second test at Hyderabad, mm -hmm. we got 267, they got 230. And then in the third test at Karachi, these are first innings totals, um, Pakistan got 328, we got 426. It gave me actually at the end of the tour after we'd lost that series, it gave me a lot of hope about our batting and how it could be quite flexible, it could adapt quite nicely and just get through, you know. Um, and uh, I, I think that was one of the, the strengths of our side. We didn't fall away too often. Yes, of course we did. Yeah, everybody does and they have a bad day. But, you know, generally we hung in there against, you know, we're scrappers. That was, and we kind of had to be mm. after the background that I was describing right at the start, the sorts of things that we had to do. We had to be that. Otherwise, you know, we'd just be blown away. Um, so that's, that's a very interesting graph for me. Um, to see that, I would have thought we might have been just a bit lower. I wonder, I wonder where, yeah, I wonder where, because I mean, you're scrappers, it's almost like in 10 positions you were scrappers, and we know sure. Martin Crowe starts to come through at the end, so, you know, I think the last couple of years he certainly starts to make a lot of runs, but essentially you were scrappers um, from the most of that time in 10 players, and then Hadley is such a transformative cricketer, right? I mean, you've talked about, we've talked about his batting almost oh, as yeah. much as his bowling. His batting was very, very handy. But we are talking about one of the most singularly destructive bowlers in the history of the game. You know, the amount of wickets he took per match, the amount of overs he could bowl as well. Um, you, know, uh, you know, Fazal Mahmood had a brief period where he was like Richard Hadley, and obviously Murley would go on to be the next bowler like that who would carry an attack. It, it, it's such a handy thing to have, but I think what this shows is it wasn't just Richard Hadley because there's no but, way that you would be a plus side in that era if it wasn't for the fact that there was so much strength all the way through that, but not no, as many true. dynamic players um, in, in the rest. I think, you know, most of we saw the averages earlier and there was no one really outstanding other than, well, J.F. Reed that happens to be picking a certain mm. time that he played a few innings and did extremely well. Um, when it came to go to the West Indies, he said he wanted to go back teaching. And that's okay. I mean, he, that's what he wanted to do. And he was always keen on teaching. Um, and so he didn't get the chance to sort of... He didn't have the drive to want to improve him, to prove himself against those kinds of issues. And that's all right, too. I didn't have any issue with that in the slightest. Um, he was always an interesting guy. He was a geographer. So, I mean, he, he just used to love going through Sri Lanka and those sorts of places. And, um, but everybody else were kind of packing in together. And, you know, it, yes, you're right. You're used to talking about people who I'm sure on your podcast who, who are outstanding. This, this was more of a team of very solid I don't want to use the word mediocre because we weren't. We didn't feel we were. And we certainly were able. Yeah. It was interesting too. After the underarm game, that was just before this period, it galvanised the whole nation mm. again for cricket and for us. And so that was a very, that was a driving force. This is important. This is a, this is, this is an important team. We are going to do things. We are going to not let these people down. And that, that became quite a, quite a thing, you know, coming through uh, that, that era that we all felt that and we weren't going to lose that, you know, that record at home. Um, it was a big thing. No, I mean, I, I, I hadn't even factored that in, but you're right. It, and also, you know, Australia going to that level, you know, 
from an emotional point of view, you feel like you've got them a little bit more. In 1970s, I know you had some good good tussles against them as well, you know, 75 and everything else. But by that stage, you realize that you are on that level. And also, Australia had slipped behind. So, you know, New Zealand were the stronger side, as you can see here. So this is your team, and this is the modern team. Now, again, I've taken out West Indies, Bangladesh, and um, Zimbabwe in this, just so it's, uh, yes. you know, again, in the top seven teams again. Um, you can see here that... You know, the New Zealand team is not as strong when they were playing against the best teams. I was shocked to see South Africa and England ahead of them in this period because this is yeah. when New Zealand win the World Test Championship. Now, it, the one thing I would say about this is I think when New Zealand were very good in this era, they were outstanding, right? But I think when they were very bad, and we saw that against India and Australia at times, they were very, very poor. There was no middle ground for this modern New Zealand team. They were either absolutely breathtaking or not very good at all. But there is a difference when you look at net average. And the reason I looked at this originally, Jeremy, is I just thought this was a fairer way of comparing the two teams based on you played in a very draw-heavy uh, draw era and they played in a very um, you know, result um, era. So, but even I was shocked that they weren't as much of a positive against the best teams as perhaps they could have been. Yeah, I would Did, have thought... Are you feeling a bit the same? South Africa have always be, proved to be difficult for New Zealand. We, of course, didn't play against them. They weren't playing. And, um, but I would have thought they might have been ahead of England. Yep. They've got, they had lots of good results against England, mm. uh, that, that, this, uh, the 2 21 side. Um, I would have thought that those two might have been swapped um, slightly. Australia, we always yep. struggled with. Um, and India, of course. And gosh, look, you've taken out the West Indies. Uh, aren't these two, isn't it fu funny, you know, how, how, sides, how sides can change? <laughs> um, mind you, I suppose it's what, 40 years? <laughs> yeah. It is. Yeah. But, but it's still, it is interesting that they're number one in that other period. And I, their, their results weren't even that important. But, but I, do, I, I, think that, I think when I put all the teams in, I think still India and Australia were ahead of New Zealand. So even if you had them against their full, um, the full amount of test teams that they played against, you know, West Indies, Bangladesh and Zimbabwe, they still only came third in this net average metric. So, and, I, and I think that's fair. I think India, for their stuff-ups in the two World Test Championship finals and not having them in, in favourable conditions has probably been a part of the reason that they haven't won those, um, have probably been the most dominant side. And Australia have been a little bit streakier, um, but they've been a very, very good side in Test cricket over that 2016 to 2021 period. And I would say that New Zealand yeah. were probably the third best team in that era again. Um, but I wouldn't say India or Australia were as strong as the West Indies um, were in the 1980s, obviously. But they were probably, you know, India were probably better than what Pakistan were. So I don't think there's any, any issue with them being the third best team in that era. But I think this does put it in a... When we are looking at just the results against the best teams, you do see that New Zealand wasn't as strong as perhaps it looked. So some of that is because of who they played. Now... <laughs> I brought you on. You yeah. said you wouldn't be able to say anything uh, at all about this. And we've, of course, talked forever. Um, I think your first answer was six minutes. I'm There's not, a not thing that called editing. Not it's that I'm keeping process. stats on your answers, Jessa. But <laughs> yeah. would, well, why would we edit all your, all your gold? But when I, I think when I first invited, I think we chatted about this last year, after you'd had that conversation <laughs> with Tim Wigmore where you made him cry in a pub. But... Um, I think at that stage, I definitely thought that, that the modern team was better than your team. I would say now, if they are, it's very, very minimal, right? Perhaps, perhaps uh, you know, because of the BJ Watling, Colin de Grandhomme thing. And we haven't even talked about the fact that your era didn't have the ability to have yeah. Devin Conway and, and, you know, Colin de Grandhomme and BJ Watling and Neil Wagner. You know, th that influx of talent has definitely helped modern New Zealand cricket. But even with all those players, I would say that both of these teams, when you look at it, are very, very of a similar level when you dry, dive into the stats. Um, that, for being that this is a professional New Zealand team now, and they have advantages and you know, can play in all these leagues around the world, and you guys were grave diggers and you know, teachers and, uh, and all this sort of stuff, there must be a sense of pride still in the fact that that was an incredibly strong team when... I know you talked about the 1949 side was incredible, but they were a team that set out to make draws and change New Zealand cricket, and they did that. 1961, obviously, is another little peak. 1969, yeah. when they beat Pakistan in, in Pakistan, there's a few little peaks. 
But it's really in the 1980s when you build what is modern day New Zealand cricket. And you did do that out of essentially Richard Hadley, you know, um, uh, John Wright and a couple of other pros. But it was essentially an amateur team that helped build New Zealand cricket as yeah, cricket I, was becoming professional. I missed that last little bit, Jared. Um, but... What I, what I was saying is the amateur team, the amateur team of that 80s is really what builds what is modern day New Zealand cricket now. Without that success, uh, it would be hard to see New Zealand I, I in a position to win a World as Test As I think back to New Zealand cricket, we've always had one or two kind of very good players in most of our sides, a world-class player like John Reid, like Bert Sutcliffe and so on, like Glenn Turner, like, a, you know, but, but this, what happened, I think, over the, the period that we played is that was, it was the elevation of the New Zealand-based player and, and them scoring and becoming more reliable um, and thinking about the game to the extent that, you know, where do you place your feet? And, you know, there was skill-based discussions, as I mentioned, most nights, um, and how we were each going to approach the solution of those. We'd all have our own ideas. We, we were very much a, a different, a very different bunch of people, and uh, we had our own ways of going about things. And uh, that, that, I think, in the end became quite a collective, even though they were slightly scattered around the ideas were scattered around and coming from different places collectively it became a very strong little unit um, and there was a lot of strong feeling about we're not going to let this team down and I think those those teams who do have that unspoken alliance between each other uh, are hard to beat hard to beat um, and so really we started from that premise and then we started to go and try and win games and uh, and it seemed to work for us. Um, Richard, clearly the key player, won more games of cricket probably than any cricketers around the world actually, along with Murley and people like that. So, uh, I, uh, yeah, he was just outstanding player. I mean, people used to go down to par, even blind people, just to listen to him bowl. So, I mean, it was, it was uh, I think... Um, a fun time to play, um, and we, I think if you had, you'd interviewing me, but I mean you could have interviewed any of us, and we would have, I think they would, we would have said similar kinds of things about the players we played with, and how we enjoyed it, um, how we enjoyed the challenges of it, some disappointments of course, but overall, um, I, I think it would be a damn good game between those two sides. Um, and, and where it would be played, probably in New Zealand. Yeah, that's okay. Um, come and play up in Auckland, absolutely yeah. grassless. <laughs> you never knew what you were going to get in Auckland. Um, whereas in, in Wellington and in Christchurch in particular, you would, you'd know what it was going to be like. Um, but I, I, think, I think that's really the feeling that I just wanted to convey. Um, and that we played the style that was prevalent at the time. What else can you do? That's what they're doing now. They're so, one team is starting to change things at the moment. Uh, and others are following along. That's how it changes, isn't it? No, uh, no, no, definitely. Look, I, I, I think I understood a little bit about the 80s cricket beforehand. But actually going through New Zealand, I think, I think what it taught me was that it was a very gritty level of cricket like you know i knew a lot about the west indies and pakistan new zealand was probably the team in that era i didn't know as much about other than the fact i knew that they had done quite well but i think going back and you have a look at those records it was just a it was a very much an arm wrestle kind of cricket and you had a very arm wrestle um you know side and then i love the fact that you were all sitting around and talking about ways of upskilling yourselves because yeah. you really are you were the, the, the self-made team, right? You know, you didn't have the access to the professionalism that other teams did. And, you know, the grave digger and the, the driver and the teachers <laughs> and so many teachers in that team. I don't know what it is about New Zealand and, and teachers. But, um, you know, all, having all that together, must have, it must have been a really exciting time. And also, it's the first time that New yeah. Zealand has success. Yeah. So 
the they were, country they, must have they been were, behind they were you. Very large crowds at times. Um, I can remember after the underarm game, for example, that the crowd spilling over all the bleachers and actually down onto the ground. I mean, they're very, very. I mean, New Zealand is, uh, you know, a sports-driven nation, and they they go with the ones of the moment and happen as it just we were lucky enough it happened to be us you know so it was a good time to play Jeremy Coney thank you very much for coming on the podcast pleasure